Lack of statistical skills is another common barrier to evidence-based physiotherapy. In this video about statistical skills, three clinician researchers tackle the barrier of understanding intention to treat analysis in trials. Ideally, when conducting a clinical trial, it's conducted according to its original protocol. But sometimes all of the participants who are randomised to receive an intervention don't receive it fully as they're intended. And that can be for a whole lot of different reasons. They might, might become unwell. They might have poor tolerance to the intervention. They might forget to an att attend an intervention appointment. They might be busy or unmotivated to participate in it. Um, but for whatever reason, it means that they won't get the intervention exactly as intended. Yeah, and then researchers have to decide how to measure and analyse the data from these participants who weren't treated as intended. A recommended option is to ignore what treatments they did or didn't receive or the extent to which they received their intended treatment and just measure and analyse their data as originally intended. So if they were originally intended to be in the group that received treatment A, then we analyse them in group treatment A. And that's called an intention to treat analysis because we're analysing the data as we originally intended to treat those patients. Now, now this might seem a little bit counterintuitive, this intention to treat approach, uh, but the benefit of the intention to treat approach is it maintains a randomisation, which is a key feature of our randomised controlled trial. And unfortunately, uh, other alternatives are, are less satisfactory. So our alternatives are to estimate actual the effect of receiving treatment, and these are the per-protocol or the as-treated analyses. The per-protocol analyses only analyse data from participants who followed the protocol as intended. So, for example, data would be excluded from people who never attended a treatment session. That would be the per-protocol approach. And as treated approach considers the treatment actually received by the participant without any regard to um, whether they actually adhered to the group they were assigned to. So an example of an as-treated, um, if we had a trial comparing, say, a, a walking exercise group compared to a no-treatment group, in an as-treated analysis, Individuals, individuals who are randomised to the walking group but decided they didn't want to engage in that therapy, they actually would be analysed in the no treatment group. So yeah. you can see, see these sort of approaches are really focusing on um, the treatment that person in, received rather than what they're intended to. Because the benefits of randomization are lost with the PERV protocol and the as treated analyses, these types of analyses actually need to be analysed with methods appropriate for non-randomised or observational studies in order to try and account for these potential differences um, in patients and mitigate problems of confounding. So as you can see, it's not intuitive to have the intention to treat, but possibly it's the best worst option. So although the intention to treat analysis doesn't seem perfect, it seems like there's no perfect solution to this. Um, so, Mark, do you have any advice to us as clinicians when we're reading papers in how we compare results when it was done with an intention to treat analysis versus the PER protocol or the as treated approach? The PER protocol analysis and the um, as treated analysis are potentially biased, and we shouldn't take them as being a more accurate picture of what's going on because they've got bias in there and we don't know which direction the bias is going in. At least with an intention to treat analysis, we know the direction of the bias. It's to make the estimate of the treatment effect a little bit smaller because we've diluted, we've accepted the dilution in the, in the um, difference in what interventions were received. It's not all people got treatment A and all people got control. It's that most people got treatment A and most people got control. So the difference in, in the um, treatments allocated is slightly weakened and so the estimate of the treatment effect is slightly weakened and that's good we can we can then say oh well 
if we still see what we think is a clinically worthwhile difference, we can be confident about that because we know that if anything, the truth is probably a little bit bigger. The true effect of the treatment is probably a little bit bigger. Whereas, and I think yeah. when we do, like when we do offer an intervention in clinical practice, we do offer it often to a bigger group of people than actually participate in it. You know, I'm thinking about you offer a group program that goes for a set number of weeks in your clinic. You know, very rarely do all of those people turn up for all weeks, but you're still going through time and effort to offer them something. So I actually think it's almost pragmatic to think about it mm. in that in that way of um, I don't just want to know about the two people that come every week. I want to know about the group that I'm offering this to from the outset. Yeah, that's the lovely thing about the intention to treat analysis is it gives you more of a real world picture. If I were, if I were to implement this therapy on my whole clinic, on everyone who's sort of eligible and appropriate from my whole clinic, what sort of average effects will I see? And that's that's what the intention to treat analysis gives you because it takes into account that even when they even when we prescribe it, some patients aren't going to do it or they aren't going to do it fully. An important point about intention to treat analysis is that you must plan to do it from the outset of the trial. It, it's something, it's an approach that you mean need to maintain throughout the data collection period in a trial. By the time a manuscript comes to the editor, I can ask the authors to give me the intention to treat analysis, but their ability to do that depends on their having measured outcomes in everyone that could be possibly measured throughout the trial, regardless of how compliant they were or whether they received the, the right treatment. And obviously there'll be some participants that you can't get hold of. If, if someone dies or moves to Antarctica, we can't get hold of them to take the measures and we just have to accept that as missing data. But if they can be um, measured, if they are, if we can possibly get them to be measured, then we should do that. And that means um, we need to advise patients about that. Yeah, so I guess as researchers, we really need to tell patients at the outset of trial um, recruitment that we, we need them to be compliant to the best of their ability with the interventions they're provided, whether it's in either groups that you're testing. I guess more importantly, we really want their data regardless of how compliant they are that their data is crucial, particularly their follow-up data. So when I'm reading trials, a lot of them don't seem to specifically report that they've conducted an intention to treat analysis. They might say something like, you know, all participants received the intervention as intended. If that happens, can I assume that an intention to treat analysis was conducted? Yeah, and just to add to that, some authors often claim in their papers that they have done an intention to treat analysis, but as you're reading the paper elsewhere, it becomes quite clear that they, they haven't because they've excluded participants who showed poor compliance um, with their allocated intervention. So, yeah, they, they, there's multiple problems. What do you think, Mark? So I mentioned before that some loss to follow-up can be unavoidable. If a patient actively withdraws from the study or moves away and you can't measure them, then it's it's not possible to, to collect that data. You will have unavoidably missing data. And some authors believe that imputation of missing data is necessary in order to claim an intention to treat analysis. They say, unless you've got 100% of data points for patients, even if some of those data points are imputed or made up, then um, you can't claim to have done an intention to treat analysis. But that's not the original definition. If you look in the Cochrane Handbook, the Consort Statement, the Pedro Scale, all of these have a definition of intention to treat analysis that is separate from the issue of missing data. Um, so if you have unavoidably missing data, you have to make a decision, am I going to accept that there's missing data? And use a, an analysis approach that copes with that, or am I going to try to impute um, the missing data? And sometimes imputation seems to work well, sometimes it doesn't work well. And so you have to consider the particular situation that you've got and whether the method of imputing data that you, you try works well or not. Um, but that is a 
a separate issue from intention to treat analysis. So you can still claim to have done an intention to treat analysis if you measure everyone that can possibly be measured and you keep them in the groups to which they were originally randomised. Now, this is a, a real problem and something that as readers of research, we should be aware of. When we look at all trials indexed on PEDRO, um, we see that about 30%, only about 30% actually um, have satisfied the intention to treat item on the PEDRO scale. So we encourage everyone to, to read a bit more about the explainer document we've attached to the notes to learn a bit more about intention to treat analysis and how we can interpret trials which have or haven't used it. This campaign is supported by World Physiotherapy and physiotherapy organisations in Australia, Italy, France and the Netherlands. Please join us in the Pedro Tackles Barriers to Evidence-Based Physiotherapy campaign and help tackle the biggest barriers to evidence-based physiotherapy. You can follow the campaign on the Pedro webpage, blog or social media.